this is Dr. K from the medical school, and today we're going to talk about acute coronary syndromes, otherwise known as heart attacks. We have split this discussion into three major parts. The first reason is that this topic is quite large, and to convey all this information takes some time. But two, a lot of details I would like to convey in as simple of a manner as possible. So I want to spend some time going over some of these details. The outline for these topics all together are as listed. We're going to go over a coronary blood supply. We're going to talk about what is an acute coronary syndrome, what are the different types of acute coronary syndrome, the pathology behind these, how are they diagnosed, what are the EKG findings in acute coronary syndrome, as well as talk about the treatment and go over some example EKGs. So let's start off this discussion with a clinical case. So you're working in an ER and a 59-year-old female with a past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, type 2, and who currently smokes two packs per day, presents with chest pressure that radiates to her neck and left arm. The pain used to occur only with exertion, but today it even continued when she was resting. Her blood pressure is 86 by 50, her heart rate 123. Respiratory rate is 24, and her temperature is 98.6. What is the appropriate next step to take? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Alright, so now that you've thought about it, what do you think that we should do? The patient's coming in with what sounds almost like a cardiac event. The patient's having a heart attack. But realize first, whenever you have a patient that you're evaluating, always go over what's called your ABCDs, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, otherwise known as other. You always have to stabilize the patient before you do anything diagnostic for the patient. I didn't talk about really much about airway and breathing this patient. The patient is tachypneic, but there's no mention of respiratory distress. So we need to focus on his circulation. The blood pressure is 86 by 50. So how do you want to resuscitate the patient? Well, to resuscitate this patient, always start off with normal saline. So I would start off with a one liter bolus of normal saline and continue to repeat that as long as the patient's responsive to it. The patient becomes unresponsive to the normal saline and I only had peripherals, I would start the patient on dopamine and get central access, whether it be a central line or PIC, most likely a central line. And then go from there once you've stabilized the patient to work up the patient. Clearly this patient needs an EKG, and whether that leads to antiplatelet agents or what have you, or cath, so on and so forth, but you really need to stabilize the patient first, then focus on working up the patient's ailment. So now let's talk about coronary circulation. Coronary circulation is split up into the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. The right coronary artery is as circled here. And here is the left coronary artery. The right coronary artery supplies the right ventricle, the AV node, the septum, the posterior and inferior walls of the left ventricle. The left coronary artery splits up into the left anterior descending and the circumflex. The LAD, or left anterior descending, supplies the anterior wall of the left ventricle, the anterior septum, the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So it's an anterior lateral distribution. Circumflex supplies the left atrium, as well as the posterior and lateral walls of the left ventricle. So posterior lateral circulation. This is the main components of the coronary circulation. It's important to know this because findings on the EKG can be correlated to specific blockages in these specific arteries. So just looking at change in the EKG, you can say, hey, the right corner is blocked or the circumflex or the LED is blocked. Doesn't always work, but majority of the time it does. So it's really important to memorize this. Now, let's go on to the next slide where we're gonna talk about what is an acute coronary syndrome. An acute coronary syndrome represents different degrees of coronary blockage that lead to decreased oxygen supply to the myocardium, resulting in various degrees of cardiac ischemia and infarction. The different types of acute coronary syndrome are 
unstable angina, NSTEMI or non-ST elevation MI, and STEMI, ST elevation MI. It is vital that you remember the differences between each type of syndrome because this will dictate how you treat the patient and also how you're labeling the patient upon admission. We'll go ahead and talk about unstable angina. Unstable angina is the partial occlusion of the coronary arteries that leads to intermittent cardiac ischemia. Patients usually describe a squeezing or pressure-like sensation in the chest that occurs mainly with exertion. In stable angina, the pain only occurs with exertion and usually is relieved by rest. In unstable angina, the pain does occur with exertion, but rest no longer relieves the pain. You have to be careful of this history in patients such as women, diabetics, and the elderly because they tend not to fit this cookie cutter model of chest pain. These population of patients can actually present with burping as their anginal equivalent, could be upper abdominal pain, could be shoulder pain. So these groups, women, diabetics, and elderly, actually present atypically. Men tend to present pretty straightforward, but these groups tend to present atypically. The difference between stable and unstable angina goes beyond just a different history of symptoms, but also down to the actual morphology of the plaque within the coronary. Usually in stable angina, when it's only occurring with exertion, the cholesterol that's building in the wall of the artery just partially occludes the lumen of the artery. In unstable angina, when the symptoms are now occurring with rest, the plaque has also ruptured or the has slightly opened to where now platelets are clotting to it, making the lumen even more narrow than it was before. That's what's causing this sudden decompensation in their symptoms, causing unstable angina. Two, you must note that unstable angina, there is no elevation in cardiac markers. Well, whether your institution uses troponins or CK, there is no elevation in cardiac markers, which you will note is a sharp difference from NSTEMI and STEMI. So, let's talk about the next acute coronary syndrome. NSTEMIs, or non-ST elevation MIs, are when there's an occlusion of the coronaries that leads to cardiac muscle infarction. It's the key difference from unstable angina, where we just had ischemia. With infarction, we now have cell death, and it is permanent. Note, there's no ST segment elevation. And what that means is, on our EKG, we have a segment of the EKG that I'll show later between the S wave and the T wave, which is flat and at our normal baseline. In non-ST elevation MI, this segment is not raised above baseline. But what it does show is there are positive cardiac markers. So whether your institution uses troponin or CK, you'll note those levels are elevated. Now, there are multiple causes to having positive cardiac markers, and we'll discuss them in part three. But note that the difference between NSTEMI and unstable angina is not a history, but the presence of positive cardiac markers. So as soon as you have a positive troponin or CK, it is automatically at the very least an NSTEMI, not unstable angina anymore. So let's go on and talk about ST elevations MI. This is the most severe acute coronary syndrome. It is a severe occlusion or complete occlusion of a coronary artery leading to infarction of cardiac tissue. The key features of an ST elevation MI are one, there is noted ST segment elevation and again, we'll go over that in part two. Two, you can have a new left bundle branch block. So whenever you have someone with acute coronary syndrome, you need to compare old and new EKGs. If you notice that a patient has a history that is consistent with an acute coronary syndrome, a heart attack, and there's a presence of a left bundle branch block that's brand new for them, you can consider this as being an ST segment elevation. 
equivalent to that. And the patient does need to be taken to the cath lab. Another thing we'll talk about a little later is that when a patient has a left bundle branch block at baseline, it's not new. It's actually old. You cannot tell if they're having SD segment elevation. Cardiologists have certain criteria that help them. When a patient has an old left bundle branch block to discern if there's an SD segment elevation, but whenever you're in this situation, it's important to consult the cardiologist rather than try to diagnose it yourself. The history will should lead you down to if they're having an acute coronary syndrome. Third, ST elevations will always present with positive cardiac markers and they'll be extremely high. But it's also important to note that when you have these three criteria, you need to activate your cath lab. Whether it's in your own hospital or if you, your hospital does not have a cath lab, you need to discuss it with the cardiologist at the other hospital that does have a cath lab. Because you need to have a discussion how long will it take for your patient to get there and whether the patient needs fibrolytics now or can they wait and get to the cath lab in time to have an actual left heart cath done with intervention. These important key things to note and we'll talk about the EKG findings associated with acute coronary syndrome. But if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, comment, subscribe. You can also follow me on, on Twitter at iMedSchool where I kind of put out daily questions and answers to kind of test yourself. Um, but this is Dr. K at iMedSchool. I'll see you next time.